And a quick note for you listeners. This episode touches on sexual assault and sexual trauma, so it may not be suitable for young audiences or survivors on the path to healing. Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. And I'm so glad that you're here because right now we are in a series called For the Love of You. And the team and I decided that we really wanted to offer experts and conversations and resources to this community as we prioritized um, healing and sometimes recovery when, as we prioritized what it means to honor our stories and our bodies, um, what it means to celebrate who we are and how we are. Um, essentially, what does it mean to be a flourishing human on this earth so that we can be in the highest service to our families and the, our communities and the people that we love and the whole entire world. And so a big part of this series is learning to take care of ourselves so that we can be present and mindful um, in the middle of our little space in the world. But for many people, and this is, and I say many, I think the numbers are astronomically high. There is either an unidentified or perhaps ignored trauma in their past that holds them back um, from, from flourishing. But here's the thing. I think when a lot of us think of the word trauma, I don't know, maybe we think about physical trauma um, or something that, uh, that our bodies maybe went through, uh, an, an accident or something that dramatically influenced our day-to-day -day lives, which is all real, a huge thing that we'll be talking about in this episode as well. Um, but in addition to physical trauma, mental trauma, as we're coming to learn more and more and more is um, finally, I think, getting the attention that it deserves in the mental health conversation, um, because this impacts everything. It impacts relationships. It impacts our ability to function daily. And then it, it literally impacts our physical health and our bodies, which we talk about in this episode. Um, and then long-term, of course, it increases our chance of experiencing depression or anxiety or PTSD. And so when it comes to treating past trauma and working towards healing, and a space of mental um, clarity and health and wholeness. It can be hard to find holistic help and then even communities that provide the proper room to heal. Um, and this is doubled down if you are additionally in a marginalized community, if you are um, a person of color, if you are in the LGBTQ plus um, community, if you are an immigrant, uh, if, if you add any sort of marginalization to your identity, it's even harder. Um, I have learned this deeply inside our community here. Um, and how mental health is really an exercise in inequality, that at, at virtually every level, it is a game of privilege and who has access to it, not only who has access to it, um, but whose communities have normalized therapy as a healthy part of, um, of life and also what are our, who are our providers look like? Because um, imagine kind of coming to a place of bringing your trauma to a place of healing and being unable to find a therapist or a counselor or a healing community that looks like you, right? That understands your specific set of, um, of, of trauma and suffering. And, and then you end up spending your own personal emotional labor, essentially trying to educate your therapist. Right. And so at every level, this is a complicated conversation, um, not just what is available, but to whom and how easily and how readily I have a fabulous guest today. I've got Jiminika Eborn with me, Jiminika. 
So Jim and Nika is a queer trauma media consultant, comprehensive sex educator, and a sexual assault and trauma expert. I mean, she basically only deals in deep waters. Um, Jim and Nika has been working in mental health for over a decade with all ages. She's led trauma-informed, comprehensive workshops at multiple universities. She's been the keynote speaker at Princeton Women's History Month uh, this year and at the UCSB Women of Color Conference in 2019. Uh, Jim and Nika saw the need for sexual education and trauma support, which led to her passion for helping those who have survived and and specifically even those without access to comprehensive sex education. So she has worked literally in all kinds of fields to be able, to build safe spaces for her clients. Um, she shares education wildly and widely and essentially supports all facets of mental health and healing. So she says, when we can come together as survivors to reflect, re-energize and regenerate ourselves, the healing magnifies. This is more than a mantra. It is my mission. And you're going to see this um, as you um, engage in our conversation today. Her work is so vital and so important and so crucial. So real quick, just reminder, if you'd like to watch us have this conversation, because this one is so tender and full of fragile um, elements of our histories and our stories. If you want to watch us talk, you can go to my YouTube channel, which all episodes are over there. So you can see um, the recording, the, vi the visual recording of our conversation, or you can just listen to it in your earbuds. So um, I'm delighted to introduce this really special leader and thinker and healer and practitioner to this community. You're going to love her. Um, so buckle up for this really profound conversation with Geminica Eborn. I want to welcome you to the For the Love podcast, Geminica. I am so grateful to have you here today. Thank you for this like labor of your time and energy for the sake of my community. I'm so thankful. I'm excited. I love creating and being a part of spaces where people are like, who the hell is that? Oh, that person exists. I didn't know I needed this in my yes. life. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. And, um, I think as all the listeners will shortly see specifically inside the type of work you do, mm -hmm. um, and we'll get there. I think there are so many people who maybe would even say on its face, no, I don't, I'm okay here. You know, I don't, this isn't something I need. And so yeah. I want you and I to really dive into that. Um, uh, cause I don't necessarily think that's, that's possibly true. And so, <laughs> Okay. So from a high level, I have, I have filled in my listeners a little bit about who you are and your credentials. Um, but for the people that are new here to your work, mm -hmm. can you just sort of discuss from a, from a 30,000 foot view um, who you are, like where you are in the world and who your people are? Um, and maybe just touch down on why this work matters so much to you. And then after that, we'll kind of dig into the minutia of it. Yeah. I mean, I can give you the quick, the qu it's not, I guess it's not quick, but I'm used to just saying it so quick. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I was straight off the back, the people that I support are survivors yeah. and they, you know, some people like to say victims. I like to say, choose whatever language feels good for you. Hmm. I like that. Because who am I to say hmm. this thing, right? It's just like, it's good. I'm, I always say when I work with folks that I'm a companion because I'm walking beside you. This mm. is your path. This is your journey, but I'm here to support you. I'm here to help you build tools and like navigate mm. and find language. And just, I think there's so much power in if we are supporting survivors, like part of it is things being taken from them. So why would I continue to talk at them instead of That's talking good. to them? It's very refreshing. I love this yeah. approach. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did. So you've already talked about other things. I did go to school to be a therapist before we get really into it. And then at, while I was in school for marriage and family therapy, I was like, this is not what I want. Yeah. So many rules. Yes. Like, yeah, therapy's great. I have a therapist. She's amazing. But also 
the humanistic approach that sometimes mm. we can't do because of the legislation, the structure, sure. check-in. And I, I think there's so much with being relational with healing. Mm. I think that healing is a community issue. Mm. It's a community situation. Yes, trauma and harm happens to individual people, but it's a community issue because mm. how does this person feel like they could do this? Yeah. What are the resources to help people after they are hurt? Hmm. So hmm. I was like, let's start heavy. Let's <laughs> um, just go in. Yeah. Let's just go but, hard. But I got here and I'll, I'll tell you the, the, how I got here. Yeah. Um, and I like to preface it with, I'm going to say a few hard things and some yeah. constant warnings, death, yeah. um, murder, sexual assault, yeah. um, pa- almost like kidnapping. Hmm. so uh, now that we've done that done that setup Mm -hmm. you know if you need to take a break please take the break but I I always identify as a child of trauma yeah so this is an early thing for me my mother was murdered when I was one years old in front of me by my I say my sperm donor we have no connection um he murdered my mother and then carried me out to his sister who went to get help and fled the scene Mm-hmm. I was raised by my grandparents, her parents, and with the support of my two aunts, which is how I got to be here. They, I was talking to my therapist this week and she's like, oh, they've been raising you through a trauma lens. Like they mm-hmm. have allowed me to flourish and be my own person, but like, please just talk to us because the person my mother was dating, they didn't know anything about him. So they're always like, we want to keep the door open because of what happened to her. So it's mm-hmm. been raised in safety, but how I got here, I actually started taking psychology classes at 15, 16 in high school. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I was nosy. Uh, I really Yeah. Was yeah. Really, yeah. Um, and when I finally got to college, I went to school for criminal justice because I wanted to become a detective. People sure. were like, well, don't you have to join the police force and all this? And I was like, yeah, but I wanted to learn actual legislation yeah. and like, language and how to help people. But while I was in there, I realized the burnout rate is very yeah. quick for what I wanted to do. My third year, when I was 21, I was raped. Mm. I woke up and I like to say the story because the idea of people being raped and or assaulted, people are always like, it's a back alley. It's this. I was home in my bed sleeping yeah. and I woke up and someone was standing over me. Mm. I had had a relationship with this person. I knew this person, yeah. someone else had let them in, but I did not consent to the situation. Yeah. I have been raped once but I've been sexually assaulted more times than I can account for. Hmm. And people are like, oh, oh, I think hmm. with that, even just that language, the tinge hmm. of that, people go, oh, wait, me too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Especially in these bodies, if you identify as them, whatever, yeah. people just feel like their hands yes. can just be upon us. Hmm. Um, and then from there, I am a unique human. Um, I got kicked out of school because I was spiraling. I turned to alcohol and partying. I carried yeah. a bar in my trunk. Mama was mm-hmm. not doing well, but yeah. I stayed in school. Even while doing it, I went to community college and then I became a rape crisis counselor. Mm-hmm. I was the person that after folks were assaulted, raped, yeah. harmed, went to the hospital as they get their SAR kit, which is the like getting the examination. Yeah. I was the person holding their hands wow. and like talking to them. Mm-hmm. So I went back to school for psychology And while I was there, I started my journey into mental health. So I started with working with juvenile sex offenders. Wow, gosh. For two years. Mm. And I I had the idea of every two years, I needed to evolve to Mm. connect with different people. So I did juvenile sex offenders, teenagers, Mm. eating disorders, adult women, um, higher level of care. And for me, what kept coming up was sexual assault, rape. Mm. Like a lot of these people a lot of the eating disorder folks yeah. because of the harm turned yeah. to eating disorders because they could control that. That's right. Which is for some people that are like, Oh, I didn't know that was a thing. And I'm like, yeah. Oof. yeah. Um, and while I was doing all of this and working in mental health, I had a lot of burnout myself mm-hmm. because of the work and because of the environment where it's sometimes yeah. very hostile, totally. not even because of the client. It literally mm-hmm. was the companies and whatnot. Um, I was like, oh, I want to do something that's ever evolving Hmm. and always going to be fun. And I was like, sex. My mom was like, oh, hell. What? (laughs) (laughs) 
like, yeah. I don't know yet, but let me figure mm-hmm. it out. But mm-hmm. I dove head first. I found every conference I could find. Mm-hmm. I went to everything. I went to what was known as Sex Geek Summer Camp and I got to meet people and we networked. And then I, I was looking at, everyone's talking about lubes and toys and condoms and orgasms, yeah. blah, 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 blah. But what about before we get there? Yeah. There's a lot of us that have trauma that want to do all these dirty, amazing things. Totally. But can't. And so of course there are people doing the work. So I've always looked at it as you don't need to recreate the wheel. You just need to figure out where the gaps are and fill it in. That's good. And so that's what I've been doing. And I'm so thankful that <sighs> people trust me to do this work. I yeah. sometimes will be sitting and will start sobbing at mm. this privilege like, I think the work that I get to do, one, chose me, and second mm. is a gift. Mm. So I do that. I run a nonprofit now for marginalized yeah. or those that have been marginalized sexual assault survivors. I work training intimacy coordinators for film and media. I work with clients. Yeah. I teach. I speak. Yeah. Ah, so that's, oh. that's the little gist. Ooh. And I'm staying in school. I have an, I'm starting school again. Uh, mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You're the, you're the big school learner type. Yeah. Uh-huh. What are you going back for? Um, a, a graduate certificate in it's like sex crime. So mm. again, like how it's actually handled in the stations and the system. Wow. Oh, that's good. That's a need of reform, obviously. Yeah, that. And also I think it'll continuously help me help my clients and help totally classes and stuff. Yes. So, I, I, I mean, I just finished alternative medicine. Like I, mom is in school always. Yes. But it's always I, in the lens of how can I continue helping of course. people in ways that are affordable. Yeah, absolutely. Because there are so many intersections between all those spaces. Um, they are not siloed out um, between sexual abuse and mental health or um, legislation and processes. These, they just all sort of dovetail together. And so um, good for you for serving it holistically. Can you tell me a little bit more about your nonprofit? What does that yeah. look like? Yeah. So my nonprofit is called Tending the Garden. I created it when I did, went to a 10 day silent retreat when all I could do was think. Ooh, <laughs> I'd be so bad at it. <laughs> Everyone's always like, how did you do it? Yeah. Like, Through tears. I cried a lot. <laughs> did you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. A yeah. Lot of yep. A lot of internal processing. But so tending the garden came about with the idea of when I was working in mental health facilities, most of the time I was the only black woman. Yeah. And because I didn't yep. want to be a therapist, I was treated differently, but I was the most qualified. And also for anyone yeah. that was not a cisgendered heterosexual white woman, yeah. everyone was treated differently. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, this feels awful, especially yeah. like I'm trying to clean up the things that you're doing. Like even going into meetings and being like, well, she's bisexual. We have to keep her away from other people. I'm like, that's not how that works. I'd be like, fun fact, I'm also bisexual and attracted to <laughs> none of you. <laughs> that is not how that works. But I love it. I wanted wanted to create spaces where people could come and actually just receive healing, where they didn't have to teach people how to show up for them. Mm -hmm. So it started out as an idea of just doing intense retreats. So we were going to do our first retreat and then COVID said, girl, sit down. So we have not, but we, it's also made us expand. So we've done an online situation, an online summit, which was beautiful. It's great. Most of the teachers were survivors. Yeah. Teaching survivors, which is what I want. Yeah. And we are now expanding. We're doing educational things, like just giving information out. We are going to have like a platform where people can do somewhat support groups. So we're building Mm -hmm. that out. Um, And we're doing different types of online summits. Like our next one, which if it all goes together in October, will be specifically for non-white, non-cisgendered folks. So trans, non-binary, be able to focus and heal. And each time I want to do a different retreat. So my idea is Mm. if we do a retreat that is for folks that have been harmed in sports, every one of the teachers is in sports or is have a connection. Mm. So they understand If if a retreat for white women. All of the teachers will be white women. I see. There's Mm. a, there's a, a disconnect when sometimes for some folks, if you're trying to get healing, and someone doesn't look like you, they don't know your journey, they're constantly yeah. questioning you and or talking at you, hmm. you're not going to get what you need. So, so having true. the teachers look like the folks that are attending 
it's also kind of like an exhale of like, oh, you're, I get to like put my things down yeah. versus yeah. continuously putting down and picking up. So yeah. it's, it's a beautiful process. I'm very gorgeous. Thankful. Yeah, it's, that's so true. I can't wait to do it in person. <laughs> oh, I, I'm so grateful for that vision. I've we've talked a lot on this podcast about the gap in mental health for people of color and certainly people in the LGBTQ community that mm-hmm. they end up spending so much of their time essentially educating their therapists. Yeah, um, and that's they, they're not even the, at the place for that emotional labor. Um, and so being able to come to the table with therapists and leaders and teachers and healers who need no explanation is really powerful. And I think a missing, a missing element in the sort of scope of mental health care for all. Mm-hmm. I, I, you mentioned it just now, but I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about it because so much of the work that you do exists in the LGBTQ space. Um, and so when you first started working with survivors, mm-hmm. Did you see, I'm curious what you saw when you surveyed the landscape, did you see a lack of resources for people who identify within this community? What, what did it look like when you first joined the conversation and, and how do you think as you kind of cast vision forward that those gaps can continuously be closed Mm -hmm. so we can ensure that all people have access to the, to the mental health that they need and that they deserve, especially when we are talking about a community with such collective trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, I'd like to hear you talk more about your work there, where it's been, where it is now and where you hope it's going. Yeah. Honestly, I think the first thing that visually just thought pops into my head is shame. Yeah. There's so much shame that is put upon the LGBTQ plus community, especially for some of those that have been survivors, right? Yeah. Well, maybe if you didn't live that way, right? Or why were you in that situation, which is a, a huge, just across the board of, well, you were harmed. Now you're going to harm other people, right? There's that idea or yeah. you were harmed. So now that's why you're gay. Yeah. Like, oh, right, 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 you, right. And which leads to shame, which leads to people not really connecting with who they are, which leads to guilt. The two good girlfriend cousins that no one wants to hang out with shame and guilt. Um, and it's, it's, it is really hard. Now, what, what I think was missing is, and what is needed still, it kind of still goes hand in hand, is the lack of education from practitioners. Hmm. Like there's classes out there that you can pay people to teach you. Like there's seminars all the time, pay for them. I think there's also a space, if we drop the P word, there's a space of privilege of like, well, everyone needs to just be treated the same way when that's not a realistic thing. Because yes, we might all look similar, but once you start adding other marginalized identities to folks, you're adding different levels of barriers and walls that these people have to fight and push through. That's right. Right. And if you're a practitioner, you should be not one of those barriers. That's right. And, and so that's what I've seen. It's a lot of fighting to mm. just be seen, a lot of fighting to be supported as just a whole human, like you mentioned before, like holistically. And for me, it's like a no brainer. It's like, these are just humans. Yeah. What's the, why, why is there such a disconnect? When people are like, oh, I'm a therapist. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> just like every educator. Yeah. yeah. That's probably shouldn't be an educator. Every therapist should not be a therapist in every field, right? (laughs) Yeah, totally. Of course. Every politician shouldn't be a politician just because you pass a test, just because people vote for you does not mean that is the work for you, which Mm. is where danger and harm is continuous happening. Yeah. You know, like figuring out your own stuff. Yeah. But that's also a level of awareness yeah. that a lot of folks don't have. That's like, mm-hmm. oh no, I'm fine. And it's like, are you though? Like, mm-hmm. I don't, ah, we should probably mm-hmm. work on this. And they're just mm-hmm. like, well, I can help everyone. But it's also the distraction of never dealing with their own stuff and just working on other people, right? Which is absolutely, both. it's easier. What, what an easy distraction. Let's easy. talk about your problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as you work with your clients, you obviously- I mean, you clearly have a way about you that invites honesty, 
And I'm, I'm going to assume you offer it too, um, which is also very contagious. And uh, when, when someone shares a piece of themselves with me, I am drawn to them. That makes it more possible for me to do the same. In this uh, current For the Love of You podcast series, we're learning how to love, heal, and honor our minds and our souls and our bodies. And what we're learning is that there are tons of ways to do this. Sometimes it can be the simplest of things like learning to embrace our bodies with acceptance and without shame. And so Third Love is a brand I love because this very element of support and self-love underlines their whole mission because they design bras and underwear along with loungewear and active wear and feel good all day wear really for all of us. And their stuff is not only comfy, it's like giving your body a hug. Third Love has inclusive sizing, which I love, developed using real women's measurements. And their best-selling t-shirt bras are constantly in rotation for me, really almost any day of the week. Um, and I have settled in to so much of their super soft loungewear lately too. Like so incredible. So word of the wise, that loungewear, perfect Christmas gift. Feeling truly is believing with third love. So upgrade to everyday pieces that love your body as much as you do. Right now you can get 20% off your first order at thirdlove.com slash for the love. So that's 20% off at thirdlove.com slash for the love. We're talking a lot about trauma, but also a lot about healing. And there's so many paths to healing, to restoring and rehabilitating mental health, to releasing shame and guilt. And a big piece of this process is therapy. Now, if therapy feels scary or new or hard to you, let me just offer a slight little nudge with better help. This is an excellent resource for professional counseling because it's such a safe and sound access point. It's all online. So your therapy session literally meets you where you are. BetterHelp's licensed therapists have a broad range of expertise categories. I mean, everything from trauma and depression to body image and eating disorders, stress, it's all, they have it all. And because it's online, BetterHelp is able to offer not only convenient and accessible options, but also affordable ones to knock down a lot of those barriers to entry. You can even start communicating with a BetterHelp therapist in under 24 hours. So as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash for the love. Join more than a million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash for the love. What are you seeing primarily really with all your clients kind of in whatever community they find themselves in at whatever intersections they have to sort of, um, you know, plow through, what are you seeing as the primary barriers from men and women moving from a place of trauma, um, which is, I think misunderstood. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about your experience with trauma and its effect on the body and the mind and the soul and the possibility, um, and sexual assault, obviously one of your areas of expertise. Um, when the people, when your clients come to you with your keen eye, what do you, and of course I'm thinking about my listeners right now who are sitting there like biting their fingernails off. Cause this is who they would be. This is them. This is their okay. experience. This is their story. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, and maybe unaddressed unshared, maybe their best people don't even know, um, yeah. to moving through the process to begin healing. So I've, I've just thrown a lot at you. You pick that up <laughs> wherever you want. I, okay. I want to talk to you about trauma. I want to talk to you about getting started. I want to talk to you about, um, barriers to overcome, um, all of that. So there you just, you take that and you start talking about it. <laughs> I'm going to pick up what you dropped off. So okay. I think a lot of times when folks come to me, it's one, they've had to retell their story to people that could never hold it. Uh, hmm. Right. And so once yeah. you tell your story to someone that can't hold it after yeah. you've already worked it up, which is hard yeah. for a lot of people so true. and they drop it or they can't, you know, hold that space for you. It's like exhausting. You're like, I don't sure. want to do this again. Right. Like people are like, well, I came to you because you just seem like a human. You seem just like a person that wasn't going to judge me. So judgment is a big thing. Also like finding community. Yeah. I think as I am so open with being a survivor, with open with being non-monogamous, with open with being bisexual, queer, however I identify, uh -huh. that also allows people to trust me because yeah. I am also being vulnerable with them. Yeah. 
totally. So I think there's, there's those issues that come up for folks is the lack of feeling safe and mm. feeling like they can trust that people can hold the space for them because possibly a lot of people have not mm. and or a lot of people have questioned them in a way. This is what I like. You drop those, those four W's, who, what, when, where, and why. Mm. A lot of times that is going to be like a little snail. You start questioning, they're just going to pull up and the object might come back out, maybe not, like go away, right? Yeah. Like because of that continued harm when they were seeking help, a lot of folks don't go back to getting help again. Yeah. Because it was so hard for them. Of course. And then if we're looking at it and one of the questions I believe you asked is like, how do I look at it? I, I look at people holistically. So for me, the reason I did not finish training to be a therapist is because I know that trauma happens to an entire body, right? Mm -hmm. So there's medical doctors and they're looking at like the physical body and all these yep. things. And then there's therapists, like psychiatrists, when they're looking at like the emotions in the right. brain. So my master's is in health psychology because we are whole people. That's right. And so looking at someone as a whole person, oftentimes when people are assaulted, they are raped, chronic pain and chronic yeah. health issues appear. And people are like, why do I have gut issues now? Totally. Why do I have all this pain in my body? Because unaddressed, it manifests into other things. And here's the, here's the few places that it might show up for folks. Of course, yeah. your shoulders, yeah. your gut, your gut, yeah. the way you process foods, we hold stress in there. And in your bowels, people yeah. are like, what? And I'm like, constipation, you know about her? Yeah. It can be connected to that. And the stress of it all mm. And it's just the way that it shows up, neck pain, hip pain, right? Like pelvic mm -hmm. pain, right? And then depends on what type of harm you've had. And mm -hmm. so when we're looking at like the full body, the emotional aspect and on a soul level, a lot of us feel so broken Yeah. and like the understanding and relearning back of who you were and who you now are because trauma I always say it's not our whole thing, right? But it's a thing that has happened to us. It might be a page in our journey, it might be a paragraph, it might be a chapter, but it's never our whole book. Mm -hmm. But when it happens, it feels like someone took the biggest book out of that bookshelf and set it ablaze. Yeah. And so you have to address all of that, but also you address it in a way that works. So talking about the work that I do, when I do intense work with folks, it's a three-month program. We were okay. like, three, three months. And I said, let me tell you why. Mm. We meet once a week for an hour. That's okay. only four hours a month. Yeah. In the first month, you are sharing your journey with me. You're sharing your story. I'm getting to know who that person is. The second month, we're now looking at the things that you've tried, the ways that people have helped you. And we're now introducing other things and we're doing trial and error. We're, we're testing. The mm. third month, we're really pushing that within you. We're really That's supporting good. you. We're really building you up. Mm -hmm. Now, do I have folks that like, this was amazing. I think I'm good for now. Absolutely. Sure. And then I have folks that are like, this was intense. This was amazing. I've cried every time I've looked at yeah. you and I'm like, That's great. And then they go into, can I still come back? I say, absolutely. You can yeah. come back whenever you want to after you yeah. do that three months intensive. Hmm. And it goes by quick. I've had yeah, clients cry every totally. time we meet because it mm -hmm. is such a raw and vulnerable time. And also yeah. because some of the things they've never told anyone. Sure. Mm. Oh, this is your day in and day out. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, but also thank you for explaining how trauma sometimes manifests in the body. I think, I think the good news is that that conversation is finding its way to the center of our collective discussion around mental health. I mean, yeah. I don't even feel like 10 years ago, we were talking about trauma in the body. It was just in our memories. Um, right. but I love seeing this body of work continue to grow and expand, um, and, and people finding healing in their joints and in their thoughts. It yeah. just, it really does dovetail together. I yeah. had trauma this last year and I kept saying, I, it just hurts so bad. Like every day, like, I think maybe I have, um, 
bronchitis or something. Like I can't, I've got an infection. I think I have a lung infection. And then of course I was like, I've got COVID. I know that I have COVID. I, yeah. Every week I thought I, I had COVID. Everything. Google helps yeah. you. Google helps I'm like, so, I don't know what it is. It's high blood pressure. Like my trauma just created my body's response to it was just like pain. But and it's also how your body's just like the only way it knows how to take care of you in that moment. That's it. Which is also I, amazing that our bodies are like, how can I fix us? Oh how my gosh. Help us? That makes me actually want to cry. Like I'm learning to love our body's responses to trauma and seeing it not as a betrayal of mm-hmm. our physical health, but rather our bodies being team us. Like, yeah. how can we get through the day? How can we manage this suffering and this pain? And so I'm, I'm grateful for what our bodies can do. And then I'm grateful for leaders like you who can help us identify what is going on and how to serve ourselves holistically. Um, which for me, all this embodiment work has done wonders for my mental trauma. Like the, the simple stuff of like the breathing and the sunshine and the walking is so big. And I always tell folks that oftentimes trauma survivors, and again, those that are marginalized are often walking around holding our breath yes. because we're waiting for that next foot to drop. Like I also, I do so much. I also lead a support group and I'm uh-huh. like, let's just breathe. And people were like, I didn't know I needed that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so anytime I'm like, let's just stop and take a breath. Cause it's yep. like, Oh, but I wanted to share something with you as we're talking about our bodies and the way we're looking at it, something that I created from a poem that I heard, and I kind of took it from Mm. this, this poet, Rudy Francisco, and he was talking about bodies and like examining, and I kind of took his poetry and turned it into this thing called body forgiveness. Hmm. You might cry. I'm just, I'm just warning you, everyone cries, Hmm. but it's a, it's a way that I talk with clients and I do this in my classes too. And it's like a homework assignment. And I'll give you an example. So I will give a, like a body outline and it's just like how we literally, because it's so easy to shame ourselves yeah. and blame our bodies for not showing up. But part of, can, I'm, I'm kind of tired of the word healing. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out a new word for it because mm. it's like this weird thing that people are trying to chase and it looks mm. so different for other people, but I'm working on, it. I'll come back mm. to that. But it's this idea of, we have to also forgive ourselves for the way that we have been trying to heal, but also shame ourselves. So I look at it as a head to toe exercise or a toe to head. And you literally go down your body and forgive yourself. Mm. So I'm going to give you an example. Okay. Ready? Yep. Um, Eyes. I forgive you for not seeing this person. (sighs) Nose. I forgive you for not smelling their bullshit. Ears, I forgive you for hearing not fully what they said, but what they just told us. Mouth, I forgive you for not speaking all the things you could. Throat, I forgive you for not being able to yell. Hands, I forgive you for not becoming fists to fight back. Arms, I forgive you for not being able to lift yourself. And that's just just like a start, but like literally going. And everyone's forgiveness looks different everyone's words look different. And this is also an activity I say, if it's hard for you, do half your body, come back to it. You can always come back because your body's still there. You always have to continue forgiving yourself. And also the forgiveness that you might need to tell yourself might also look different from, from today to tomorrow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something that I've done. And I, I taught a class a few weeks ago for survivors. I'm doing a series right now of mm. sex after trauma. The class this month is how to support a survivor and September is dating as a survivor. Oh. So it's, it's fun. Oh. I love it. But one of the things was like, someone was like, but how long did it take you to get through body forgiveness? I said, who said I was through it? Yeah. And they were like, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and it's ongoing. Like, it's an ongoing process. We are continuously mm. working our system because as our system evolves, which I look at our bodies as circuit boards, right? Like, and the ways that we get support, it's just triggering different things and different things light up. Acupuncture might work. Massages mm. might work. Yeah. Um, 
talk therapy might work. Somatic therapy might work. You're just figuring out what system yeah. we're switching on for you. Yeah. I love that you say that. I appreciate the permission to move into whatever environment of recovery matters. Mm-hmm. I, last summer when I was at the bottom of the ocean and I just thought, well, I'm just not going to make it. One of my friends suggested, well, I don't really even know what to call her, to be honest with you. Like she's like a body healer. And Mm -hmm. so I would lay on her table, like in all my clothes and she would barely touch me. I mean, it wasn't massage. It was like, she barely just touched my chest. She kind of energy healing, like energy healing. She'd feel my body and she, yeah, it was like that. And Mm -hmm. she'd say words and I'd respond to it. And she would be like, I can, okay. I feel that right there. Like, let this go right here. And I'm just telling you. So at first I kind of went in thinking uh, this is, you know, hoodoo. And, but every time I'd lay on her table and just cry my eyes out, she'd hit like just a place and I'd say something. And she's like, it's right here. And it was a, it was a pathway to me to begin to release some of it. And so thank you for just saying whatever works is whatever works. Absolutely. Like, I went and, and maybe be open to it. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. definitely went the spiritual route of learning to reconnect my body and like learning meditation and like me too. that allowed me to tap in before I did talk therapy. Everyone's always like, we have yeah. to get a therapist. You have to do this. And I'm like, I mean, that's an option. Yeah. Right. Because that mm. might not work for you. And when people are like, well, this is the only way it's just like, did you report it to the police? Why didn't you do that? Uh, Because a lot of harm happens to folks when they do that. I didn't report mine. I didn't even tell anyone I had been raped for seven years. Ugh. Because that was my path. That was my journey. But we should also normalize that people are allowed to do what works for them and not question, why didn't you do this? And that's why I teach the allied to accomplice class, like how to support survivors. So my idea is if we can help on the back end, if I That's can help good. on the back end to help people help people, maybe we can show up because again, this is a community issue. Yeah. Yeah. I love you. I love that you're saying that because let's be honest for, for a ton of people, therapy is a privilege. Not everybody can absolutely. afford that. Absolutely, Our healthcare system doesn't prioritize mental health care at all. Um, that is just seen as optional. If you can, if you can afford to plunk down a check for it. Um, and so there is a lot of healing available to us inside our own bodies, inside our own thoughts and minds and souls. And, um, as being something of self healers, um, to some degree. And so I wonder if you could talk through thinking about, um, all of the, and you of course know the data and so do I on how many women have been sexually assaulted. Um, it's, it's astro- I mean, it's just astronomical. It's, I think the last time I saw was like one in four. Um, yeah, is it even the, worse than that? It, it says it's one in three, but one also, in three, but also a lot of people don't report. So I, don't of believe, course, I, I think it's like one in two, a hundred percent. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and so just knowing that let's just say half of the people listening have some sort of experience with sexual trauma or sexual assault. Um, I wonder if you could just, obviously this is an enormous, enormous conversation and can never be distilled down to one answer, but I wonder if you could just talk maybe briefly through, um, these are traditionally some coping mechanisms that a lot of survivors will try to grab onto that maybe don't serve us well. It's just what we're reaching for. Maybe we don't know what else to reach for. And on the flip side, these are maybe some resources and tools that survivors can begin adopting to start the process of recovery. Yeah, I think the easiest things that we use are the distraction things, drinking, drugs, uh-huh. yeah. partying, the numbing, the disconnection, yeah. because if we don't have to think about it, did it really happen? I, again, after I was raped, I carried a bar in my trunk. I was Gosh. numb. I was just like, I, listen, I carried everything but ice because that would melt. Um, at cups, at mixers, like I was fun. I was partying. 
if you see this idea of I'm mm-hmm. fine, I'm perfect, people don't question you. That's right. You get to just be, and mm-hmm. people don't look at you as broken. Yeah. And so that's the thing that folks might do, right? Now, something that actually might be some helpful things that maybe you've tried or I've tried, um, I think literally sometimes for some folks is spending time in nature and like yeah. spending time with yourself. You're yep. like, what? I'm like, yeah. No, it's learning, real. Learning grounding techniques for yourself. You mm. can be triggered by any of your five senses, but you can right. also be grounded mm. by any of your five senses. That's nice. Yeah. And it's so true. figuring out what feels good for you. I'll give you a quick mm. story. Um, three years ago, I was moving into my best friend's house out of a, a rough situation, roommate situation. Mm-hmm. And I was in my car and like my phone was going off. My mom was calling me. I, my manager was, at the time was texting me and I got a Venmo request. So I was like, Ooh, who's sending me money? It was the person that raped me. It oh, was the gosh. year that he raped me and it was a request for 25 cents. And so because I knew myself, because I had been doing the thing, which is a process, right? I knew I had 30 minutes. Mm. I had 30 minutes before it was going to burn down. So for me, I said, let me get to where I lived at the time. And there was a beautiful park there. Mm. I said, let me go to the park. I took my shoes off. We're now doing her grounding. I'm touching the grass with my feet. I'm like, this isn't working. I am looking at the water. So we're doing our senses. I'm looking yeah. at the water. I'm seeing it. I'm touching it. I'm like, this isn't working. Someone's playing music. I'm trying to like uh-huh. focus in. Yeah. I'm playing my favorite song. Um, I see the Elote man. I'm like, let me get some of this. Like I'm trying to eat. I'm doing all the things. While I'm doing all of this, something that I've also, and I teach folks to do is to create a safety contact list. Oh, that's good. And so it's like ways to ask for help from your people. Yeah. Everyone knows the relationships you have. Like you have friends and you know who shows up best to do what thing. Yeah. So you ask them, will you be my person? And you create a whole thing. You create a safe word. Safe words aren't just for kinks, they're for life. Mm -hmm. And so you create a safe word. So for example, if I was like, Jen, will you be my person? If I send you the word blue, will you immediately call me and start reading me this quote? Oh, or good. will you text mm. me or will you send me food? Will you find my location and come get me? Right. So it's different things and you have people show up for you. So I text my people and was like, here's what happened. I'm not doing great. So I had someone checking in to make sure I was eating. I had someone to check in and see how my mm. mental health was. I had someone to make sure I was drinking. I had great. someone just sending me things like, mm. because it's, you are training people how to train to training yes. people how to hold you in the space that you need to be held. That's so good. That and is so, so good. That is a thing that I think when we're talking about how to help ourselves, helping ourselves is doing the work up front of like, this is how I need you to help me. You train That's people. right. Yeah. This goes back to what you keep saying about healing and community. That's been my experience too. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, I've never experienced any meaningful healing or recovery outside of my people that, Mm -hmm. that, that is that layer of safety and security and intervention and proximity and even physical touch. Like part of my thing to my friends is, uh, can you just come over and I, can I lay in your lap? Just can I put my head Absolutely. in your lap? You don't even have to talk about it, but can I just so whatever the thing is, I I find this so important what you're saying right now. That's such a good tool. I cannot wait for people to hear that and realize how accessible that is as a practice. Um, to to put that in place ahead of time so that it yeah. is there when you need it. We are all walking through so many different situations of our own personal stories. But have you noticed that your physical comfort, like right down to your shoes, can really affect your mood and how you literally walk through the day? I know it does for me. If I'm uncomfortable in any single solitary thing I'm wearing, I feel it. So when it comes to footwear, I know a lot of you already are Rothy's girls. I love this brand because at the very basic level, Rothy's shoes are so comfortable. They're staples for me. And right now, Rothy's has the sweetest autumn collection of flats 
and loafers and more. And they're all in like these washable, soft, plush, merino wool styles. They are gorgeous. Fall hues like currant and clove and wintergreen and ice blue. And of course, they're just as comfortable as all their shoes. So word to the wise. If you are thinking about gifts for the guys in your life, Rothy's has a men's collection too, you guys. So to help you welcome the fall season in style, Rothy's is doing something special. They gave us the chance to share this very, very rare opportunity with my listeners for a limited time. So right now you can get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash for the love. So that's R-O-T-H-Y-S.com slash for the love. So head over there, rothys.com slash for the love. Find your new favorites today. I'm so thankful for this conversation with you. I want to ask a couple of, these are just quick final questions that I'm asking everybody in this series. This series is called for the love of you. And I think what we wanted to do in this community was really do a deep dive on what does it mean to prioritize our own health? Mm -hmm. Um, if we need it, our own recovery, um, our own flourishing ultimately, because there's a beautiful upside to this work. Let's go, you know, let's thrive, let's live. And so we love, I love that too, the other side of the coin. And so anyway, I'm asking all my guests in this series, these questions. So here's the first one. Um, what's just top of your head, like what's the number one thing that you do to honor you? your own self. Oh, absolutely. Every quarter I give myself a getaway. It's just me. And because I'm in Southern California, right near the desert, I go to the desert for three days to a week, just by myself. And it's a quarter. I want to be you. It's the sanity aspect. And I'm like, but the last time I went, I was like, we are only wearing underwear, lingerie. We're hiking. We are, we're, we're going to have beautiful dinners. We're going to, you know, take whatever type of medicine we need to take. And maybe that includes champagne if that feels good. Like we're doing the thing, but once a quarter, (sighs) I've been doing it for since last year. And so it's, it's, it's up. It's, I need to do one in September, just go somewhere. And I've, I've invited people once and I might (laughs) do it again because Mm -hmm. I don't think that people understand how much they need to just get away. And the desert is great because I'll get like. 20, 20 acres to myself. Wow. Just me. My mom's like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to keep doing this. Take a friend. I'm like, no, I need it. I'll tell you why I love this so much. Um, I had the same sense inside my own body after this making it through a year of this last year. I went to Maine, where I've never been by myself for three weeks. Like, I just, I'm going to be by the ocean. I'm going to, I have no agenda. Like I had no agenda. I'm like, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to eat. I'm going to take naps. I'm going to read. I'm going to take long walks. That's what I do. I I called it me camp and it has changed me. Like, I'm like, oh, me camp is a thing I'm going to do. This is. I, I'm, I like my own company and there's something about not filling it with all my, my people that is even, it, that's even different than traveling with the people that we love, like just mm-hmm. alone in my, like with my thoughts and with my hopes and anyway, so yes to this, yeah. I'm a huge fan of this. Okay. Here's the next question. What is like, cause this is a lot of self-honoring work. What is one of your favorite things about yourself that you love? Mm. Um, My adaptability. Mm. Um, In the work that I do that I'm adaptable, I also, I I do, I do too much. I do so much, not too much. Like in a support group, you have to be adaptable. I also work with our houseless community. You have to be adaptable. Working with intense work, you have to be adaptable. Having conversations, you have to be adaptable. But like for myself, if I'm like, this is not serving me anymore. The adaptability is saying I'm done. That's it. That's true. That counts. It does count. And it's it's that adaptability and also the permission. So giving myself the adaptability of things and also giving myself continued permission. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's so great. Here's the last question. And I ask 
all my guests. This is always my final question. I, I learned it from a priest that I love. And she, she posed this question once and I've thought about it for a decade, but, um, mm. and it can be whatever you want. You can like, you can have an earnest answer or it can be like the dumbest thing in the whole world. Um, her questions, what is saving your life right now? Mm. This work. I bet it is this work because, and I've heard this from my therapist. I've heard it when I had like a spiritual guider, I've never seen someone do this work and also have their own work intertwined and like my own personal work and continue to grow and flourish by also helping people. Right. So, Mm. and this is also why I stay in school. I went back for a graduate certificate in alternative medicine because of the idea of our ancestors did not have all these pills. They use things from the earth. And so I can find things to help people's pain, to help people get grounded, to help people's anxiety naturally and affordable. That is is a way to do a thing. So going to school is continuously learning. It's like, Oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, that's what I've been doing. And what I've learned in helping other people. Mm. So that that's my, you're a deep well of stuff. (laughs) That is so good. I love that. I, so, okay. I know now at this point that the people listening in my world are going to want to connect with you. Um, and, learn from you and kind of sit under your leadership. And so can you please talk about where to find you? Um, where, where are the best places to seek you out in the internet world? Yeah. I think to, to really get like an idea to get a feel of me, trauma queen dot love. That's my website. It is dot love. People are like, are you sure? And I'm like, I created it. Uh, trauma queen dot love. And I'm Jiminika on Instagram, yeah. which is where you will always keep up to what I'm doing, what I'm sharing. Now, if you want to see me go off on people mm-hmm. and talk about professional wrestling, because that's my favorite. I want to see this. Yes, that's my Twitter. Uh, uh-huh. So it's Jim and Ika on everything because there's only one of me. <laughs> it's just you. Just it's one. just you. Yeah, if you can spell it, you can find me. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Hey, thank you for today. I want to just recognize that you diving into all of these places is a, a heavy lift And it's an emotional labor that you don't have to do, but you choose to do, um, particularly like here in service of my community. And so I thank you for it. I really do for going into these places with me for a whole hour. I'm so grateful. And I know it'll serve so many women um, that listen. So look, I'm on, I'm team you. Okay. So anything I can ever do to support your work, um, to shout it from the rooftops. I want to do it. So now, you know that. All right, Jim you are so great. Thank you for today. Thank you. This was great. I love having you. How I start my day. Just talking about trauma. Yeah. Just like you, like we do as one Simple. does. Simple. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So for those of you who are like your heart is like pricked, with this discussion and this is you and this is where you are. This is part of your story. It's maybe part of your history. Um, It's part of your work or you want it to be part of your work. This is a really good leader to look to. So if you go to jenhatmaker.com, Com, under the podcast tab, I'll have this entire episode, including all links to Jim Anika's social places, her website, Um, everything that she has done. If you'd like just one place to find all of her work, you can find it over there. Um, I think you can tell that the way that she approaches her clients and this work is um, authentic. None of it feels couched in therapeutic language or vernacular, or even like a veneer. It feels very raw and very accessible. Um, I, I just found myself over the course of this conversation, just feeling like I trust her, you know, when somebody gives you that impression. And so I hope this serves you in some way, maybe serves as a stepping stone to, to something next for you, if that's where you're at in your story. And just know that we continually want to create a space here for you, 
and for what you bring to the table. And we want to provide resources and experts and ideas that will always aid you in your journey, in your healing, in your process, in your growth. Um, so on behalf of Laura, our producer and her incredible team and Amanda and I, we are delighted to bring this this show to you and specifically this whole series. And so I, I hope it's serving you. If you've missed any of it, go back and pick up what you've missed um, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get them and you'll never miss a single episode. So thanks you guys for being here week in and week out and you will not want to miss next week too. So I'll see you then. <laughs>